Thanks to David and, and Michael Lardner for of the Marxist Education Project uh, for organizing this uh, series of events in the Socialist Register 2022. Uh, new polarizations, old contradictions on the crisis of centrism. I've worked with Leo Panich for, I guess, now 12, uh, 12 volumes of the Register. And we, we worked on, I don't know, a dozen other publishing projects over the year. Tragically, uh, he died as we were beginning uh, to work on this volume. We had commissioned it, started interacting with the, with the authors, and kind of mapped out what we wanted to accomplish. And he was struck uh, by cancer and then COVID in the hospital. So we lost him uh, along the way. I was very fortunate to have Colin Wees come on board to edit the volume. Colin, of course, is uh, one of the great Marxist intellectuals for several decades, uh, writing on Britain, Africa, other parts of the world. Colin edited the register with Leo for over a dozen years, and they had written some of the, together uh, some of their, their great books on parliamentary socialism and British labor. So it was a great, great pleasure for me to uh, work with Colin, uh, to learn from him. Uh, I had actually was fortunate to have actually, uh, known Colin uh, back to the uh, 1980s in, um, in Canada when he was uh, teaching at uh, Queen's University in Kingston here. And we had worked on editing a, a journal, so it was kind of uh, great fun to make connections and develop a working relationship with, with Colin again. And putting the volume together, we wanted to kind of, uh, we wanted to focus on the political polarization that seemed everywhere. Uh, that was what we had, uh, Leo and I had struck as seemed uh, uh, important to capture, uh, to capture this uh, moment in the context, uh, essentially where we had conceived the longer term in terms of neoliberalism, but in particular in the context and the, and the class transformations and new political configurations that had emerged in, in the span from the great financial crisis from 2008 to 10 to the pandemic crisis and to capture that moment and not look at it just at the level of the of, of surfaces of, of and appearances that was kind of the way it was polarizations were being discussed in the media, but try to penetrate the underlying mechanisms and social conflicts, uh, social structures, which were laying behind the world of appearances of political polarization. And that's a, it was in the sense of uh, that Marx had laid out his own own project, not that the world of appearances is false, but need to be explained by underlying contradictions and social structures and, and, and the political strategies of class agencies. We sought to gather essays in, in broadly three areas, capture uh, uh, this moment, uh, one was on, on a set of issues that seemed important to tackle in themselves, uh, uh, on income and wealth polarizations, the pandemic, on social media, on the far right, uh, on identity politics, uh, all that we managed to get terrific essays from, you know, Simon Mahon, Walden Bello, uh, Jahadi Ghosh, Marcus Gilroy Ware, Ingar Salti, so some of the big named writers around the world on these issues. It also seemed necessary to take on what had obviously been animating all of us uh, where we live is some of the dimensions of political polarization in the societies we live in. And it seemed to us uh, when we conceived this, Leo and I were, were thinking especially of, of the, the states uh, that had been characterized especially as the zones of, of social and political polarization. Uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, Russia, uh, Germany and Central Europe around the far right, uh, and then the politics that had exploded in a very visually in forms of political polarization in the US uh, around Black Lives Matter to, of course, the, 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 the events with, the, with Stamp, the Trump administration. So that was the second uh, kind of uh, area that we wanted to make sure we had fairly comprehensive uh, coverage of, of these different uh, zones of the world. The third was to look at the left and alternatives. Uh, and in the context which we had been posing for quite a while in the register in terms of some notion of polarized option with the crisis of centrism and the evacuation from the left of social democracy having moved and become uh, integrated in, uh, as a, a set of, of uh, as a political options or political forms of neoliberalism themselves uh, uh, in power. Uh, the other was also to think about this in terms of what was revealed in terms of, of the Corbyn project about those polarized options 
following on the heels of, of, of some of the other developments in Europe around Podemos and Spain or in Syria and Greece and, 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 and take on those themes of what a new left might look like. And of course, it was also the question of, of, of how seriously and how to assess uh, the Biden project of Build Back Better. So those are the, uh, you know, the areas that we attempted to cover in the volume. Um, I think it's uh, really a, a, a very interesting and strong volume. Of course, I have my commitments to it, uh, but it also is, I think, that we still see so few studies of kind of that question directly. Uh, although if we're talking about it all along, all, all the time, ab about attempting to theorize and think through uh, the different forms of polarization and 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 try to uh, assess this conjuncture together. One of the most important essays in the volume is exactly that, coming from Ilya Matviev and Oleg Servolov Sur on uh, on social sources of political polarization in Russia. Uh, one of the paradynamic cases of uh, since the uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and passing through the period of, of shock therapy that you know most most of us who are uh, have followed in, to different degrees closely uh, and the, uh, and has been a, a focal point for any of us who are socialist and thinking about the trajectory of capitalism over the last 30 or 40 years has uh, been following that very closely. Both Ilya and Oleg are at the Public Social Sociology Laboratory at the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg. Uh, it is one of the outstanding sources of, of independent assessments uh, of Russian politics, social opinion, and everything else that uh, sociologists and others do. So I think uh, that's all I have to say. And I'll turn it over to Ilya, who wanted to speak at three, but is now speaking a lot earlier. And I'm, I know he spoke earlier today, so <laughs> he's uh, certainly putting in his hours of labor. <laughs> Thank you, Ilya. Thank you so much. Thank you. So it's actually not a problem for me to speak uh, earlier than three, but uh, Oleg will come uh, a little later. I actually have a PowerPoint. This is a PowerPoint. Uh, can you see it? Is everything okay? When I received uh, the invitation to talk about uh, my article in uh, the volume of Socialist Register, I actually couldn't even imagine that this will be under these circumstances. The war changes everything. That's you know the bottom line of uh, what I'm going to speak about today. So the war changes everything. The war changes everything in Russia. It's a completely different country now. And uh, I think that the war changes everything globally as well. So it's basically a world historic event. What I will try to do today is, first of all, to uh, talk about our article, to name the main points and uh, unpack the main points in a brief way. And I will also try to examine whether any of those points are still relevant, in fact, after, after you know, the war began. And uh, I think some of them are. I think that some of our analysis is still relevant uh, today. And uh, our article sort of illuminates tendencies that uh, emerged in the last month in Russian politics and Russian society. So in some, in some way, it is helpful. So it's not completely dated, in fact. I will begin by talking about the article. It is called Loft Offices and Factory Towns social sources of political polarization in Russia. So what we meant by this title was that uh, some people still work in uh, industrial and, you know, in industry, in uh, factories. These factories in Russia, many of them are located in uh, company towns because in the Soviet Union, uh, cities were built around industry. They were built around factories. So a lot of, lot of cities actually have uh, a single factory that provides work for everyone. And this became emblematic of uh, the problems uh, in Russian society in the 90s, for instance, because all these factories closed down and all those cities that uh, relied on a single factory, they, they were left with nothing. So factory towns are an image of uh, you know Soviet working class that is uh, 
under threat by these new capitalist conditions. And loft offices basically indicate a new group of people, urban uh, middle class professionals who emerged in the 2000s, uh, in the 2010s. They are highly educated and they work in creative industries. They work in uh, uh, various uh, professional office jobs and they represent a different class. Our title was a reference to basically a class basis, not just a social basis, but a class basis of potential polarization in Russian society. So uh, we made several claims. The first claim was that Russian society was highly polarized in the 90s. On the one hand, there was a liberal or democratic camp. And uh, this camp was presided by Boris Yeltsin, the president of the country. And uh, on the other hand, there was uh, the so-called red-brown opposition. So the Communist Party that emerged after collapse of the Soviet Union. So uh, it was the main opposition to Yeltsin's uh, rule, essentially. And uh, the problem with this opposition was that it united uh, leftist tendencies and nationalist tendencies, in fact. So it was a combination of uh, sort of nostalgic communist and uh, nationalist opposition and uh, liberal democratic camp, camp that was in power. And uh, uh, there was a true polarization in society. So uh, people did not vote for uh, centrist parties in the 90s in Russia. And uh, there was still a semblance of democracy. So uh, votes were actually counted. And uh, voting records revealed that people either voted for this liberal camp, extreme liberal camp, or they voted for this rather extreme, rather radical red-brown opposition. And there was a class dimension to this in a sense that workers and peasants supported the Communist Party. They supported the opposition. And uh, people who lived in big cities, educated people, the emerging middle class, the emerging you know, professional class, they supported the liberal camp and they supported Yeltsin. And uh, there was a clear dividing line between the classes. And uh, studies actually demonstrated the connection between uh, the class position of people in society and uh, their political views and uh, their voting patterns. So there was a clear connection between class and vote. And uh, in the next decade, in the 2000s, this actually changed because the polarization that existed in society in the 90s, it uh, almost disappeared under Vladimir Putin's rule. And uh, the reason was that um, people retreated into private life. They were no longer interested in politics at all. And uh, Putin actually liked it that way. Uh, he preferred to rule over this depoliticized society, which was not interested at all in participating in politics. And this allowed Kremlin, this allowed Putin to build an authoritarian regime because uh, society was not ready to um, oppose this kind of development. There was a so sort of um, unspoken uh, pact between uh, uh, the population and uh, the Kremlin. And the pact was that the Kremlin is uh, enriching itself. You know, these people are enriching themselves. They engage in rampant corruption. Uh, on the other hand, they do not interfere in the lives of ordinary people. And then there is economic growth. And so uh, the people do not interfere with the Kremlin. The Kremlin does not interfere with the people. And this was the basis of Putin's rule in the 2000s. So polarization receded and uh, there was no true political conflict in society. But then things changed again in the next decade, in the 2010s. So a new opposition movement emerged in 2011, 2012. It was a period of mass protests in Russia with uh, 100,000 people in Moscow. So the biggest demonstration in late 2011 was uh, 100,000 people, maybe even more. It was completely unprecedented because nothing like that happened uh, in the previous decade when Putin just came to power. You know, opposition to Putin existed of maybe hundreds of people. And then suddenly this new movement broke out that uh, consisted on 
hundreds of thousands of people. And I would say that this threat to the regime has never been completely extinguished. So even now, after a decade of uh, repression, after a decade of uh, crazy propaganda, still uh, Russian society is more politically active than it was in uh, 2000s. So this uh, sort of genie of political activity was left out of the bottle and it is still there. Even now, even, even the, in the condition of this war, so still Russian society is more politically active than it was in the 2000s. In the article, we investigate the class nature of this opposition movement. And we come to the conclusion that uh, indeed there is a class basis to this. And uh, this new opposition movement is a middle class movement, essentially. It's a movement of urban professionals, of uh, people with uh, higher education. And in that sense, its class basis is rather narrow. So it has always been a problem for the opposition movement in Russia. You know, those people who oppose Putin, that uh, the social basis of this movement was narrow. And uh, um, until very recently, even the leaders of the movement were not really interested in expanding, you know, the class basis of this movement. So they were liberals and uh, they were not interested in incorporating, for instance, the working class into this movement. And uh, our argument is that Alexei Navalny uh, has always been different from uh, other opposition leaders in Russia because uh, he's a populist politician. He's a populist politician in the sense that he wants to build a cross-class uh, coalition and uh, his populist appeals. With them, he tries to unite Russian society and to include those people who were not previously included in the opposition movement. And this is why Navalny became the most powerful opposition leader. This is, this is why he became the most threatening uh, opposition leader, the most threatening to the regime. This is why ultimately Putin decided first uh, to kill him and then uh, he could not succeed, so to imprison him. Because Navalny's populist tactics proved to be uh, quite successful in expanding the social basis of the opposition movement. Uh, but this process was stopped short by uh, repression, by brute force. So in the article, we show that uh, when the mass movement emerged in 2011, 2012, uh, the Kremlin responded, first of all, with uh, propaganda, with an ideological offensive. And this was the time when the Kremlin started to emphasize nationalist rhetoric. And now we see uh, the fruits of the of this, you know, emergent nationalism on the part of the Kremlin. So now uh, this great Russian chauvinism developed into full ideology of ethnic cleansing, unfortunately, towards Ukrainians. But this started a decade ago in response to this uh, opposition movement. The Kremlin also emphasized uh, conservative themes, traditionalist themes, and at this time, Putin decided to become the leader of, you know, reactionary forces of the world. So uh, he, he uh, uh, maybe a year ago, he gave an interview to uh, Financial Times, I think, in which he claimed that liberalism is dead uh, globally. And uh, it's time of traditional values. It's time of uh, conservative values. And Russia represents these traditional values, conservative values, and so on. But initially, this was a response to the opposition movement. So this did not emerge sort of um, spontaneously. This was uh, a calculated response to political threat. And the second thing that the Kremlin used was repression. So in the last decade, Russian regime became much more repressive than it was before. Uh, and uh, this, this, this has gotten worse and worse and worse with every year, basically. The very important thing was that the Kremlin relied on propaganda, on ideology. It relied on repression, but it never created its own loyalist street movement. So this, this was rather stark. This was striking because on the one hand, you have tens of thousands of people uh, going on the streets opposing the regime. On the other hand, uh, there are no people on the streets supporting the regime. In that sense, uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it's it's a stark contrast with uh, countries like uh, Venezuela, for instance, where you have uh, the opposition, which is a mass movement, but you also have uh, uh, people who are loyal to the ideas of Hugo Chavez, and it is also a street movement. So in Russia, nothing like that ever happened. So people who are loyal to Putin, they stay at home and they watch TV. And this is the only thing that is required of them by the regime, right? The Kremlin has always been afraid of grassroots activity of any kind, even the loyalist kind, even the people who actually support Putin's ideas. So the Kremlin has never allowed them to actually do anything on their own. The, the regime only tolerates uh, its own uh, you know, creations. So if the regime sends people to beat some opposition activists, then it's okay. If it's a spontaneous activity, then, then these people will be persecuted. And uh, this, is, this is a rather you know, important uh, feature of uh, Putin's regime. Uh, rejection of any kind of grassroots activity and deep suspicion towards any kind of grassroots activity in society. When we move to the recent uh, Russia's political history, so the last year or so, uh, we saw that uh, Navalny returned to Russia. He was immediately uh, imprisoned, as you know, and uh, he also his organization launched uh, this famous investigation into Putin's own personal corruption, into the palace that Putin built, or some friends built it for him in, uh, in the south of Russia. And uh, these two events, this investigation and Navalny's imprisonment, uh, started uh, a political crisis. And uh, Navalny managed to mobilize uh, actually hundreds of thousands of people across the country again and reinvigorate the opposition movement but um, and, and this demonstrated once again that um, you know this problem of uh, opposition activity has never been solved by the Kremlin so the only thing that the Kremlin could do was to just persecute everyone and this is exactly what they did police presence on the streets was just completely incredible uh, a year ago, when these demonstrations uh, happened, I was demonstrating with with other people, and this was uh, well. First of all, this was quite scary because there was like riot police everywhere and so on. But then, just the the sheer amount of police presence on the streets was completely, completely incredible. And uh, what they managed to do was to just uh, disperse all these demonstrations and something like 20,000 people in total were arrested and a lot of them received short-term prison sentences like 15 days, 30 days. And um, some of them, maybe about 100, received uh, criminal sentences for like a year, two years, three years. So the only instrument left to the Kremlin was repression basically. But unfortunately, in the short term, it's a rather effective instrument, because uh, when you just uh, destroy the opposition movement that is not ready to move from peaceful protest to anything else, then uh, this opposition movement cannot, cannot exist, basically. And this is the point where we stopped our narrative in the article. So uh, it, it's not a very positive outlook. But at least we sort of registered that opposition to Putinism uh, is becoming more diverse. You know, it, it now includes more people from the Russian regions. It includes more working class people. It includes more poor people. And uh, the logic of this opposition between united people and uh, corrupt elite uh, sort of makes the social basis of the movement wider. So this was a positive development. But then the war happens. And uh, the question is, is uh, anything from our article relevant uh, at the current moment? So first of all, uh, my, my position is that Russia is currently descending into a form of fascism or uh, what Hans uh, Traverso, uh, a, you know, a leftist thinker, calls post-fascism. I would say that uh, Russian Russian state is a fascist state yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Nevertheless, 
the points that we made in the article that the Kremlin completely rejects any kind of bottom-up activity, it still holds. So even now, uh, the regime uh, does not allow, uh, for instance, pro-war demonstrations. All of them, so the nationalist uh, activists try to organize demonstrations supporting the war, but all they all were denied permits to do this, and this never happened. So the only street movement that uh, Kremlin allows is uh, a kind of uh, spectacle of a demonstration organized by the Kremlin itself. So uh, they just use public employees. Uh, they uh, go on buses to, to Moscow from, from near, uh, nearest regions. And then there is this huge, huge sort of rally or more like a performance. And Putin uh, has spoken at this uh, performance, but they do not allow loyalist demonstrations even from Russian nationalists, even now. And uh, recently a bookstore that is operated by some nationalist you know, intellectuals, it was raided by police, even, even though those intellectuals supported the war. And they completely, share all Putin's ideas about the non-existence of Ukrainian nation and so on. So they actually agree with Putin on everything, but still they were raided by police. This is, this is a peculiar, peculiar way of relating to society. So Russian state is a fascist state, I would say. Currently, it is a fascist state. Ideologically, it moved towards ideology of uh, sort of nationalist superiority and even uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, of Ukrainians. So the things that are published on Russian official uh, news sources, official uh, newspapers, for instance, those articles, they are completely, you know, this is like Felkisher Beabachter, basically. But at the same time, any kind of grassroots, uh, grassroots activity in support of this, uh, it is not allowed. And this is a, you know, a point that we made in our article. Secondly, I would say that there is literally no place left for the opposition movement in its previous form. So mm, politically, you know, the level of repression is such that any kind of political, independent political activity, any kind of opposition activity is basically impossible in Russia. It is, uh, you know, it is, uh, so it's met with uh, criminal sentences, it's met with prison time. Uh, so any criticism is also completely prohibited, and uh, all independent media are banned in Russia. Even the most long-standing newspapers, such as Nova Gazeta, uh, the editor of Nova Gazeta, Dmitry Muratov, was awarded the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize recently, and, and Nova Gazeta is closed now. So this was the last independent news source uh, standing in Russia, now it is closed. There is no political space for the opposition movement. There is no cultural space because uh, any kind of uh, non-isolationist, let's say, ideology, um, it, it is impossible to, to, to sustain it in Russia. It is going towards, towards extreme nationalism, basically, in every sphere of life. And even economically. So, the, like I said, the class basis of the opposition movement was this uh, middle class professionals in big cities. And uh, because of the economic crisis, because of the impact of sanctions, that is extreme and very severe. The sanctions are working you know, very effectively towards destroying the Russian economy. So because of the impact of sanctions, those people who participated in opposition activities, basically they have to leave Russia now. And uh, according to some people, at least half a million half a million people left Russia in the last month, 500,000 people. That, that is incredible. Based on this, it's very hard to say uh, well, something positive, right? It's very hard to say, uh, to provide this sort of positive outlook for the future, because I would say that I'm still, I'm still shocked by what happens. And uh, like I said in the beginning, war changed everything in Russia. I can only hope that a combination of, uh, you know, strain on the elite that is put by sanctions, by economic crisis, by everything, and uh, bottom-up discontent with uh, extreme poverty that is coming to Russia, with a complete lack of prospects in the future. So a combination of, you know, elite defection and popular protest will lead to some political change. So. 
this uh, uh, this might be possible, but at the same time, uh, the infrastructure of repression that uh, Putin's regime has built is uh, extremely strong. It's just hundreds of thousands of people whose only task is to <laughs> prevent any kind of political change from happening. So in that sense, uh, the prospects are uh, rather bleak, I would say. Nevertheless, I want to emphasize that anti-war movement in Russia still exists and uh, some activities are carried out and uh, they are mostly symbolic now, but I think uh, it's very important because they reveal that there is a tension in Russian society, that beneath the surface, actually millions of people reject this war. They just do not have a way to express this. They do not have a way to effectively politically express this. So maybe this will change uh, in the future. So this is what I wanted to say. Uh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> that was a bit tough. But <laughs> I, I, I thought, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to David, but I was just gonna say to Ilya, I thought, uh, I uh, reread your article. I thought it still had a, a lot to say about the underlying decay and polarization that no kind of movements had been able to break out and therefore had prepared uh, the foundations for the inability of an of a, of a, a anti-war movement to easily arise. So much along the lines you, you had spoken to. I'll turn it over to David to kind of uh, manage the Q&A. Uh, Mike, if you want to unmute yourself, Previn, then uh, go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. Oh, well, thanks, David. Yeah, Ilya, very, very hard to listen to uh, what, what you were saying there. I have a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first one is when Navalny was poisoned, um, I think he went to Germany uh, for treatment, yeah? And I just could not understand why he went back to Russia because it was so obvious, so obvious that they were going to either arrest him or kill him again. And um, this idea of trying to if you like, uh, run an opposition from within a dictatorship country it seems to be a high risk strategy. Uh, I get the ideological purity of doing that. I understand that it might give you some kind of great moral feeling that you're doing the right thing, but tactically, it doesn't seem very sensible. Um, and it seems, you know, when you think of Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, organizing the revolution, mostly outside Russia, that would be a sensible tactical move for the oppositions rather than fighting from within and especially in Navalny's case where it was so obvious so obvious they were going to just do something to him you know so I don't I don't understand why when he had that opportunity when he was in Germany he didn't stay there uh, and stay in Europe and run the run the campaigns from there because he had the broad base anyway I think he's decentralized the whole opposition movement anyway so it wasn't that reliant on him as a cult figure so th that's one thing that really puzzled me. I never kind of got to the bottom of that. Another quick question, if I may, um, it just concerns you. You are in St. Petersburg, is that right, in, in Russia? Is that correct? No, I'm currently in Istanbul, so. I oh, had... okay, okay, yeah. that's a different thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because I was just wondering how, all right, so you're a good example of that because I was just wondering how opposition movements are surviving in, in, yeah. in, in Russia because they're just gonna be smashed. Uh, and this is just not the time, it seems to me, to, you know, for the activist centers of thinking to be working from within um, yeah. the, 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 the country. Uh, and, and my last question was simply if you have any information on where are the centers of opposition now in, in, in Russia, given that it's a dictatorship. Right. Thank you. So I will start with the question about Navalny. Actually, uh, so first of all, uh, the idea that he would be able to organize something in Russia from afar, unfortunately, probably it, it would not have worked because uh, his organization was completely dismantled, right? So he had a network of uh, branches in different Russian cities, and uh, this was actually quite effective. So people from his organization, they even were able to uh, elect their own candidates in some local assemblies 
even under the conditions of you know Russian completely unfair elections, still they were able to place their candidates. They were very actively fighting on several thr fronts, and his organization was quite strong. But then it was just um, you know dismantled. Uh, it was uh, deemed extremist by court, so <laughs> the Russian court you know equated Navalny's organization with ISIS for instance it's the same legal status now and uh, it was just completely destroyed and then I mean what could he do from from afar so he could record the videos but then his uh, uh, closest associates can also record those videos right so he did not have any special <laughs> special ability to do the things that other people in his team are, are, are currently doing and uh, in fact, he was the only one who returned to Russia. All of them, they actually left Russia. So all of his uh, associates, all of the people closest to him, they left Russia and they now operate from, I, I don't even know which country actually, they do not they like to publicize it, but so they're not in Russia at the moment. So Navalny's organization, he, the key members of his organization, they are not in Russia. And uh, uh, Navalny himself, in, in light of what I just said, uh, his return to Russia was basically the way to claim, you know, moral right to, to be a leader, I would say. And uh, perhaps, uh, you know, I like probably it doesn't matter that much. But at the same time, uh, for, uh, after the war, I finally understood what, like, what, was, what was the purpose of his return. Because before that, I, I asked myself the same question as you asked. So why couldn't he just uh, do something from, from Europe? for instance. But now I understand that uh, he is uh, uh, one of the very few people who have the moral right to speak, you know, on behalf of Russia. If, if Russia has any kind of future outside of Putin, then Navalny will be, you know, the person who would say, I went to prison for my beliefs. So now, uh, uh, despite what our country did, uh, I, I actually took responsibility. I took responsibility and now I have the moral right and moral standing to speak. I think this will be very important. But um, yeah, so it was sort of heroism. Navalny, I mean, he has a lot of problems. So like, like everyone knows uh, his beginning, he beginnings as a nationalist. He eventually rejected, but still he's not, he's not the friend of the left in any sense. He's not a leftist person, but at the same time, as a politician, I think uh, he is tending towards this sort of heroic position, right? So like Nelson Mandela. And I would say that uh, at the current moment, after, after the poisoning, after his imprisonment, under actually completely awful conditions. So he's, he's not quite close to Mandela in the way, you know, he suffered. So... Yeah, I mean, th this is how I would answer. So in terms of uh, my own like personal safety, unfortunately, uh, people who, who still speak up against, you know, the war or against Putin in any way, the absolute majority of them have to leave. It's, it's impossible from Russia. It's impossible to do from Russia because uh, there is now a criminal sentence for discrediting Russian army, discrediting everything that Russia does, basically. And so any, any criticism of the war and even calling the war a war and not special operation, this is now punishable by law. And so, yeah, so it is just impossible to, to do anything while staying in Russia. So, and I don't want to be like Navalny. It's not, unfortunately, it's not, it's not in my character. Like I don't, I don't feel enough for, uh, uh, I don't know what, I don't feel enough uh, stamina to do this. So yeah, that's about me. Uh, on the other hand, some people do stay in Russia. So I think the logical way is for people who stay in Russia, first of all, not to speak uh, publicly. There is, there is a sort of division of labor that people who stay, they try to gather information, they try to talk to people. And uh, in fact, there is something, you know, like some potential for... Uh, uh, agitation in, in the working class now because uh, workers are dismissed, uh, like tens of thousands of people are dismissed because of the sanctions, because of the economic crisis. There is a discontent in uh, in factories. It is sort of slow, slowly boiling. It is slowly emerging, and uh, some like socialist activists try to influence that. 
but those who speak publicly, they, they it's impossible for them to stay. Those who do not speak publicly, they can try to stay, but it's obviously like uh, very dangerous. And uh, also the prognosis is bad. So uh, it, it could get much worse in the future because, because Russia is uh, probably like, it will probably lose this war. So like there is a, a real potential for, for Russia to literally lose the war and not achieve any of its objectives in the war. And uh, after that, uh, I don't even want to think of what uh, Putin will do inside the country, because this will be a sort of revenge for his failure to, to do what he wanted in Ukraine. So Russian society will bear the brunt of his anger for this. In terms of safety of activists, it uh, doesn't look good. What kind of opposition exists in terms of what people can still do? These are small scale things like uh, graffiti, like stickers, some uh, performances that people did, like people lying on the streets uh, and uh, repeating the scenes from, you know, these massacres uh, in, in Bucha and other places. There is uh, a feminist movement is actually extremely active and uh, feminists launched an anti-war feminist initiative and uh, they're documenting stuff and uh, like they're very active in, in different ways. So single person pickets, for instance, you go to the street and you hold a banner. So this uh, ends very quickly with you being arrested, but still you can do this, you know. So stuff like this. In, in terms of actual like actions, it's a very limited <laughs> repertoire of action, but uh, something can be done. And uh, like the positive thing here, if there is anything positive is that a lot of people reject this work. It's actually a very sizable part of society. And uh, I know that there are these uh, opinion polls that say that, uh, you know, it's like 85% of people support the war and 15% uh, of people reject the war. So the polls are, uh, there is, these results are invalid meth methodologically because people who are uh, against uh, the war, they just, they are afraid to, to even to respond to pollsters. And this is completely understandable because any criticism of the war is punishable you know, by law. And then suddenly someone asks you the question, so do you support the war? And then it doesn't make sense to answer, no, I do not support the war. So you don't even know uh, where your answer will be recorded. So in that sense, any polls coming from Russia, this is an important point. They, they are just meaningless. All these numbers, they do not tell anything. And uh, like some sociologists try to do uh, a sort of, you know, indirect poll. There is a technique, it's called least experiment, when they try to sort of hide this question among other questions. And when they did this, uh, their result was like 50% of people actually expressed support for war. If they were asked in this indirect way, where they the answer could not be identified. So 50% and not 80%. This is closer to reality. I think that uh, there is a, a split in Russian society. So a polarization, if you want. And uh, half of the people do not support the war, but uh, it's impossible for them to express that under current conditions. Yeah, if I could just briefly come back to, to, to you on that one and just to say that there's two kind of oppositions, you know, one is the activist populist stuff. And as you said, Navalny's not a left wing guy anyway, right, mm -hmm. but he's just opposition. So, you know, we all kind of hang on to him. But OK, so there is the populist opposition and you can try and take out Putin that way. What, what I feel is a, another vacuum is an ideological opposition. Um, and that the ideological center, whether it's inside or outside Russia, but an ideological opposition has not been organized. And again, maybe I'm just crazily nostalgic about, you know, the Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin era, uh, pre the revolution. But there's something about starting ideological centers outside the country of uh, dictatorship that can, mm -hmm. in its time, in its historical moment, if the doorway opens, that you can get in. And of course, that ideological center then becomes the basis of future government. And that's kind of what happened in October 1917. And that there seems to be this obsession with, you know, we've got to fight Putin on the streets and stuff, which of course we do, of course we do. But it's not the only way. And of course the left has this vacuum now, you know, of intellectual, uh, like an intellectual vacuum where we don't present ourselves uh, for whatever reasons, uh, embarrassment, failures, uh, conflicted, rethinking, regrouping. But I think Russia particularly, or the dictatorship countries need ideological centers more than ever because I think people will respond. I think they will. 
because within that ideological center, you'll find the one or two people who can communicate to the population and simplify the, uh, the more complex arguments. And mm -hmm. I feel the left is badly, badly missing that. And this is the time, you know, it's happening. It's uh, capitalism is cr not crumbling, but it's in crisis. Um, this would be a good time to uh, set up an ideological center, even mm -hmm. if it's in Istanbul. Good luck. Yeah. So, yeah, I actually agree. And uh, what we we always try to do is to present a consistent analysis and not mm. just, you know, as opposed to Navalny's populism, which is extremely eclectic, yeah. you know, at, what, at some point he wants to provide like social safety net. At another point, he wants to privatize, you know, state enterprises. So it's very like inconsistent. And this is the definition of populism, you know, it's like... Uh, uh, moving in different directions. And so the left has always tried to present some kind of programmatic alternative to this. And we write about this in the article. And uh, yeah, this, this is a, the task for us. So this is what we should do. We should try to think of reforms for Russia from a leftist perspective. Think of, you know, a program, actually, yeah. even though, yeah, it's not clear who will implement this program. But I agree that we need to think of a program and uh, Alek actually joined I think right now and this was his point all along so uh, he, he always claimed that uh, we need to think about the program we need to think oh. about the program that we will present to the population so maybe uh, he will elaborate on this uh, before that uh, Peter Fay you posted uh, an article about um, polling in Russia did you want to say anything about that or was uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, I was just posting information, uh, which is different from what we're hearing. Uh, I don't really uh, don't have much response to this other than it's what I'm hearing today is not really very different from what I hear from, you know, MSNBC or any other you know, American news source. It's there seems to be I'm not sure what to me, this doesn't sound really like a leftist analysis of what's going on, but I'm not an expert on, on Russia. So I, I really, I guess I really don't have a whole lot to say. I just want to point out that there seem to be counter, uh, counter arguments to what we're hearing that, uh, you know, Putin's popularity is soaring. Uh, but of course, you know, those are polls. So uh, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't really, uh, have a whole lot to add. Um, so should, should we let Oleg speak if he wants to uh, of course, add yeah. anything? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Oleg. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I, I skipped the um, um, whole discussion. Uh, but concerning the programmatic uh, ambitions of, of the Russian left, I would say that it is not, our, not only our uh, duty, it is also our chance and our opportunity to to promote ourselves because liberals including uh, populist uh, figures like uh, Alexei Navalny uh, they, they they had been they had been very successful in terms of uh, uh, street mobilization of, of people in Russia uh, and this is uh, what uh, we cannot do unfortunately leftists cannot mobilize uh, much people uh, in the streets now. However, the, the same uh, liberal mainstream politicians, including Nav Navalny himself, they uh, uh, made uh, the very uh, genre of uh, political debates over uh, the programmatic uh, issues very popular and uh, attractive uh, for, for, for a wider audience. And uh, uh, within these uh, circumsta circumstances, uh, we can promote ourselves uh, as uh, pe pe people who who uh, ha had been working on uh, reforms uh, about uh, which uh, Ilya just was talking about, so due 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 to the pop popularity of of this genre of uh, public uh, debates over over programs, uh, leftists who are quite uh, uh, successful in articulation and and development of, of these programmatic issues can uh, be seen. Uh, more powerful than liberal opposition. So that's 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 our, our uh, idea. Okay, I wanted to know with all of this, the the the, 
the West, the Western bourgeois powers have, besides all the sanctions that are destroying life for day-to-day -day living in Russia, they've also been attacking the various oligarchs and, and speak as though all the oligarchs are a united bloc with Putin. Is there any type of, of are there fissures developing in the ruling, uh, amongst the ruling kleptocrats where this, uh, that are causing any erosion of Putin's base with the class that he represents. Uh, the one person commented, I don't trust our news sources very well, but I would think that there must be some divisions, but the, the, the repression is so thoroughgoing and everyone has watched so much. I don't know if it gets any air within Russia, but outside many of these oligarchs have remained in their towers on Central Park South or or in their, their yachts, et cetera, wherever they happen to be. Uh, so I just wonder if there is some type of fissure in the, uh, the ruling group uh, in Russia. Right. So I can try to answer that. To us as uh, Marxists, this has always been the central question, right? So how to explain uh, the fact that uh, Russian imperialism in, in recent years goes directly against the interests of the ruling class. Because in previous periods, we saw that Putin's regime was actually extremely beneficial to the oligarchs in terms of their personal enrichment. So they made most of their fortunes during Putin's period, not during the 90s. In fact, during Putin's period, and the number of billionaires increased absolutely dramatically. But my point, uh, well, before all this happened, in my analysis, I tried to develop this notion that Russian regime is a Bonapartist regime in the sense that Putin uh, caters to the interests of uh, the oligarchs, of the billionaires, but at the same time, he is not uh, beholden to them uh, politically. So they, do not, they have no influence. They have no real influence of, on him. They can only hope that they will that he will continue to support uh, so their ambitions they can only hope that this will happen and uh, like like marx said about uh, napoleon the 3rd and about the bourgeoisie he was like napoleon was actually uh, representing the bourgeoisie but state always threatened the position of the bourgeoisie so the bourgeoisie understood that the state could uh, turn against them as well and I think uh, this is what happened. So previously they enjoyed the benefits of Putinism, but now they can no longer do this because uh, for some reason, Russian regime decided to, you know, to do this imperialist expansion that actually goes completely against the interests of this globally integrated you know, ruling class. And um, th there is definitely a tension even by public pronouncements, you can see that several uh, big uh, corporations in Russia made public statements that they want, uh, you know, the hostilities to end, that they want peace. So this was all very uh, subdued, very, uh, you know, accurate, but still they expressed this sort of discontent with what's going on. And uh, in some cases, it was an attempt to avoid sanctions, actually. So they like they say that, oh, you know, this war is bad, so please do not sanction us. So something like this. I think that uh, the companies are getting, the oligarchs, they're getting, they're getting more and more frustrated with uh, what's going on. But the problem is they cannot do anything. In a Bonapartist regime, uh, bourgeoisie has no real political power. So as, as Marx pointed out precisely, and uh, ultimately, if they're not happy, then I think the government will nationalize their companies. So the, like this, this is the end point. If they really want to, to protest, then they will just lose the assets in Russia. They're like just uh, those uh, Siloviki, those FSB people, they, they will just take over their assets. And uh, this is why, even though there is a tension, it cannot result in any kind of uh, regime change because they do not have the resources, they do not have leverage to do this. 
And uh, these people, they're, you know, they're rather cowardly. They're not uh, the material to do a coup. So <laughs> they would prefer to just leave and uh, maintain some of their assets and live uh, a comfortable life in Dubai, for instance. If there are sanctions in Europe, they will go to Middle East, they will go to Dubai, they will have these luxury apartments there and still have this lifestyle and this will be enough for them. So yeah, so in terms of this, the oligarchs will not end the Russian regime. It should come from a different section of the elite, probably from inside the security apparatus. But uh, it's like when I thought about this, it's not clear why would FSB people, for instance, want this regime to end because uh, they do not have any opportunities for uh, outside of this regime. So who would need uh, FSB guys, right? So they, they, they have everything here, but they might lose everything if, uh, if, if there is a democratization of the Russian regime. And so in that sense, uh, it's not likely that uh, uh, a coup from inside the security apparatus will happen. But outside of it, uh, the ruling class does not have real political power within this sort of arrangement. Um, Barbara is next. Do you want to unmute yourself, Barbara? Yes. I just wanted to comment something, um, which is that while I do not doubt that, uh, or I totally agree with the classification of Putin as a sort of authoritarian Bonapartist figure, I think this makes sense. I'm a little surprised, or I wonder if it's um, if it makes sense from a Marxist perspective to ignore the apparent connections, or can we really ignore that there is maybe a connection between figures like Navalny and somebody like Guaido, for example, um, Agnes, or other figures that are like Zelensky, I would even say the argument and I don't want to excuse this, obviously, right? But the argument from the Putin side is that this he is a CIA-backed figure, right? And I mean, we all know that this happens all over the world. We know very clearly that the US has a political goal of deposing Putin, um, just as it had that goal in many other places across the world. And it's done that more or less successfully. There's a video of Hillary Clinton from the beginning of March saying that a lot of people in the US are looking at the situation in Ukraine in the same way that they looked at Afghanistan. And that, so comparing Zelensky's government to the Mujahideen, that if this uh, government were to be uh, funded and armed, that this war could last many years and that Russia could come out of it losing. And uh, I just think that while it is, of course, legitimate to build up and conceive of a left opposition to Putin within Russia, we also have to understand the other side of what's going on, right? And I find it very strange to see an apparent alliance between a Marxist left and somebody like Navalny. And then I also think it's important to consider that the, Russia is at the moment at war with NATO, right? It's not just with Ukraine. This is, it might be the beginning of a third world war. This war is with the US. So even the most liberal democratic country in a context of, in such a dangerous context, certain liberties will be curtailed. And this is just in respect to, you know, the government right now being um, very controlling of public demonstrations, political demonstrations on the right and the left. Considering, you know, if you look at the history of Europe during second world war, that was the kind of thing that was happening all the time. But my question is, isn't, it, isn't there something similar between Navalny and Guaido and all of these springs that pop up in the world? And I don't mean to legitimate, to, to, to um, obviously um, defend that he should be, or, or the actions that Putin took against him, but um, can't it be that both sides are not great? First of all, I would say that Russia is not Latin America and uh, other parts of the world are not similar to Latin America in terms of uh, the dynamics of uh, American imperialism. Navalny is not supported by the CIA. It's just a fact. It's a plain fact that he is not supported by the CIA. And uh, secondly, 
I disagree that uh, the United States wants to depose Putin. It's not true. Uh, up until the war, they were completely content with uh, Putin's regime because uh, Putin was integrated into this global network of corruption and uh, he was providing natural resources for the developed world and uh, he did not pose any kind of threat to, to global capitalism dominated by the West. And uh, America was perfectly you know, content with having Putin in power. And they did not want uh, any kind of regime change in Russia. And even now, I don't think it's true. I don't think that they want uh, regime change in Russia. Both sides are bad or this type of arguments. Uh, I disagree. I disagree because uh, in authoritarian conditions, any kind of organization of the working class, which should be the goal of the left, is impossible. Any kind of progress that the left can achieve depends on the achievement of political democracy. Without political democracy, the left will be powerless in Russia because uh, the only alternative as a sort of Leninist type revolution, that is impossible because of many, many different factors right now. It's impossible. So uh, an armed uprising of the working class is impossible. Therefore, the progress of the working class depends on political democracy. So without political democracy, the left will be in a state where, where it is now, in a state of, uh, you know, just being repressed, being without any means to achieve any of its goals. And so in that sense, uh, there is no alliance with Navalny. It's not like we work for Navalny. It's not like we're part of his organization. The fact that um, leftists go to opposition rallies that Navalny calls for, but uh, uh, it's not uh, an organizational alliance in any sense. And I would say that the left, uh, like I said, the left should always present its own program and be consistent in its commitments and uh, always oppose uh, Navalny on ideological grounds. But saying that both sides are bad at the current moment we, means uh, uh, political irrelevance. And this is just, you know, uh, like a pure position that uh, you can feel good about this, that you criticize this faction of the bourgeoisie, you criticize that faction of the bourgeoisie, then you just have no influence on anything at all. So you can feel good about yourself, but then uh, it's meaningless. So... Uh, in terms of uh, Russia fighting with NATO, Russia curtailing liberties because it is fighting with NATO. In fact, all the liberties were curtailed before the war. So, uh, so, so in, in our article, we write about the fact that every organized opposition in Russia was completely destroyed by the regime. Like everything, everything that exists in Russia was destroyed. So Navalny's organization was completely destroyed by the regime. And... Uh, all the other organizations, like hundreds of people are in prison. And this happened before the war. It, it did not happen because of NATO. NATO has nothing to do with what happens in Russia now. This is another point that is still completely misunderstood by uh, international left. So we try to talk about this as Russian socialists, but no one just listens to us. Everyone repeats NATO, NATO, NATO. It's not about NATO. It's about Russian imperialism which is different from American imperialism. It has a different dynamic. It is driven by its own internal sources. It is not driven by NATO. Putin does what he does, not because of NATO. Putin does it because of his uh, extreme uh, nationalism, imperial nationalism, and his uh, actual like desire to extend the Russian empire. And what he said in his speeches, we should treat it as uh, a literal cause for this war. He said that there is some kind of historic Russia that should unite Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and we are going to fight for this historic Russia. I think it's a better explanation of what's happening than uh, a confrontation with NATO, because if Putin wanted to beat NATO with war, then it was uh, a losing project from the start. You cannot beat NATO by starting a war, because NATO suddenly now has a purpose. They say we're a defensive alliance, and we're going to increase our presence in Eastern Europe, which they do now. You know, we're going to send nuclear weapons to Poland and Putin can do nothing to stop it. He can, can do anything to stop this. So in fact, with this invasion, Putin actually expanded NATO presence in Europe.
In that sense, he lost if his actual purpose was to stop the expansion of NATO. Now NATO is expanded and he can't do anything about this. And in fact, he strengthened NATO by his actions. So NATO is much stronger than it was before because Putin launched this war. So uh, like my general comment would be that the left is based on the concrete analysis of concrete situation, let's say. And situation in Russia should be analyzed separately from situation in Venezuela, for instance, because in Venezuela, it's a different dynamic. You know, the the, the um, Hugo Chavez and uh, Nicolas Maduro, they have a basis in uh, uh, the organization of the poor people and the organization of the working class. And uh, uh, the conflict that still, you know, exists in Venezuela, it's a class conflict. In Russia, it's different. Putin is not a representative of the, of the working class in any sense. He has no mass movement of the working class that supports him, like in any shape or form uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, America has zero influence of, on Russian opposition. Like, yes, uh, America finances opposition in uh, Latin American countries. It's true, because those countries are anti-American because of their leftist governments. In Russia, it's different. America does not finance anything. It has zero influence on Russian political dynamics. It's our own internal matter. And uh, in that sense, like the bottom line is that we need to analyze specific situations according to what's going on and not just use some uh, schemes that we use in different places, you know, to analyze Russia, because it's a different thing. It's a different situation. And uh, in that sense, the way the global left understands what's going on in our region needs to be updated. This is, this is like the real thing. We need to produce a new theory of imperialism that will be able to account for Russia and not just for America and for NATO. Uh, Richard Myers. Is up next. Yes, um, you know, thank you both to, to Ilya and Oleg for helping us to understand a little bit more of what's going on uh, in Russia. My question sort of follows a little bit from the last one, but I want to sharpen one part of that. And that is, what do you think is the focus for the class analysis and the class audience for both one Navalny's populism and secondly a Marxist left analysis of the situation? And I'm thinking in terms somewhat of, in your article, you talked about the four Russias and trying to understand the complexity of the situation there. Uh, I know that's, those are not necessarily seen as classes or class elements in each of those four categories. Um, but if we're looking at those four Russias and maybe more specific class formations in Russia, where is the appeal from Navalny and for a Marxist left analysis? And is that appeal, to what degree is that appeal having making having any progress or finding an audience mm -hmm. among those different class formations within Russia? We try to base our class analysis on this idea that indeed Russia is divided between uh, uh, four big, uh, let's say, social groups. And uh, among these social groups, uh, two groups are the biggest. On the one hand, you have uh, people who live in big cities, middle-class professionals with higher education. On the other hand, you have the working class. The working class is the industrial working class that lives in uh, smaller smaller cities uh, with, uh, with some remnants of Soviet industry, or maybe they're de-industrializing de de now, but this is like the working class. Also, the working class lives in big cities as well and works in the service industry, just like in any other country uh, in the world. Navalny tries to unite these two groups of people by just by populism, by rejecting a consistent program. So the definition of populism is that instead of a program, you have uh, just a symbol, right? Like where the 99%, for instance, it's not a political program. It's more like a slogan that can potentially unite completely different people. And uh, in that sense, uh, like I said, uh, programmatically, Navalny is inconsistent. And there is also like, it doesn't make sense to talk about his organization because it no longer exists. But uh, when it existed, there was a real problem that on the one hand, he had some uh, social demands and Navalny's rhetoric was frequently 
uh, sort of it was not left leaning, but it, it included a lot of um, social social demands for increasing the welfare state, uh, increasing pensions, increasing education and healthcare spending, and such. But on the other hand, the economists around Navalny who prepared some concrete, uh, you know, programs for him, some concrete uh, reforms that he uh, uh, popularized. So these economists, they are completely neoliberal, right? And potentially this is going to be a huge pro, like if Navalny comes to power, he's going to be, uh, yes, he's going to be a neoliberal politician and uh, it will be the task of the left to uh, principally oppose everything he wants to do in Russia. But I would say that the left will have much bigger chances to do anything in a democratic setting where Navalny is president, where he, rather than in the authoritarian setting, then Putin is president. So in terms of opposing Navalny, this will have some chance of actually influencing government policy because uh, uh, Navalny will be exposed as a, you know, inconsistent leader without, without a real program that pronounces, you know, uh, social stuff and actually does. Uh, so let's say talks left, walks right. So this, this is the, uh, the expression. So this, this will be exposed and then the left will have a chance to stand out with its more consistent program. In that sense, the left should already build a broad coalition as well. And uh, this coalition should be built around just ordinary people. You know, not it's, it should not be built around uh, this like middle class people or those who are left in Moscow and Petersburg. It should be built around ordinary people. It should be sensitive to their concrete uh, situation. And so the propaganda should be focused on ordinary people and on uh, working class people. And uh, at the same time, at the same time, like I said, in the present situation, when there is no organized opposition, including left opposition. So the left in Russia exists uh, in a sort of ephemeral state. So if it tries to go beyond uh, uh, websites, lectures, uh, some small scale like activist activity, then it is immediately crushed by the regime, right? In that sense, to talk about sort of trying to appeal to the working class is very difficult because it is politically impossible. Right. Russia is not the same as it was in 1917, when there was also like a violent authoritarian regime, but at the same time, there was uh, a very militant working class that was uh, receptive to the leadership of, uh, of the communist movement. So now it is different. There is no working class that is receptive to that, and that is militant. John, you have a comment or a question? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, thank you for that, um, Ilya. It was uh, it was great listening to you. Uh, it's uh, very difficult, as you can imagine, for us uh, in the West to get a, any clear idea of the um, events that are going in the situation in Russia. I do want to, you know, uh, give you some feedback on your sense that NATO has uh, nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. Just to go back to the 90s, when, uh, you know, when uh, uh, this, the Soviet Union was, you know, was, was dissolved, there was a sense that Gorbachev got a, you know, got a commitment uh, from Reagan not to go past East Germany. Uh, when Clinton came in, that was thrown out, and the Clinton administration proceeded to organize and fund the color revolutions in the former Warsaw Pact countries. And they, um, many, many high ranking American officials, CIA people, diplomats, other intellectuals warned the uh, Washington not to go to Russia's border because the war that's happening there now would be happening. It was in a sense, a war foretold. Putin, for the last 20 years, has been saying exactly that. Please don't come to our borders. We understand here that there are American missiles in Poland, in Romania, aimed at Moscow. 
So it's very hard for us to accept that there is, uh, there's no uh, NATO. I always think of it's US slash NATO because NATO is a creation of, uh, of the United States that um, they don't have an invested interest here. Uh, I'm gonna allude partially to what Barbara was saying earlier, that there is a perception that there is in fact two aspects to this war. The first aspect is the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war that it's perpetrating uh, on Ukraine. But there's another level of the war that's going on, another aspect, and that's the inter-imperial war between Russia and, in, and the United States. One aspect of that that seems to be quite relevant is that during the Madden days, the number one American politician in the Ukraine, Victoria Nuland, was publicly announced that she was very proud that the Americans had poured $5 billion into the Ukraine. In effort, uh, in, in effort it, you know, to alienate it from Russia and turn it towards the West. Now, I'm sure that there's you know, underlying reasons why they would do that without $5 billion. But $5 billion can do a lot of persuading. And that only not dollars, though that, th those dollars were buying talent, resources, and were particularly in the younger generation, we're training them in the various uh, social media platforms to, uh, you know, to generate uh, a, a, a more sympathetic, you know, Western view in Ukraine. So that is some of the reasons why the you know people uh, leftists in the West have more focused on, or are particularly focused on NATO's role. And here in Canada, of course. We are sitting on top of one of the, you know, the American empire or the source of the American empire. So we have, a, you know, a, of course, a different point of view uh, from what is going on in other parts of the world. So can you comment on that, please? Uh, the first thing about the so-called color revolutions, uh, they were not uh, inspired or created by the United States. It's not true on the factual level, because, you know, this kind of statement is not in the spirit of Marxist analysis. So any kind of, uh, it's not a revolution in the Marxist sense, obviously, because there was no victory for the working class or anything like this. But at the same time, uh, Marxism emphasizes objectively existing contradictions in society and not some kind of uh, inspiration by a foreign power or something like this. So these uh, movements in uh, Eastern European countries, they were caused by internal contradictions, which were abundant, you know, which were abundant in those countries. And uh, in many ways, like many of those so-called color revolutions, they were actually democratic movements. I mean, yes, they were supported by the United States, but this did not in any way alter their dynamic. And this was not decisive in the fact that those uh, color revolutions happened. So this was not about America, it, uh, like post-Soviet space is not Latin America, it's a different region. It was not about America in any sense. It was about the internal contradictions of these uh, societies. So the problem with these democratic movements in uh, countries like Georgia, uh, Armenia, uh, Ukraine, uh, Kyrgyzstan, so those places where those uh, uh, democratic movements happened, the problem was that uh, these movements in themselves, they were not socialist movements, right? And no one claims that. This was uh, a mixed class movement with different factions of, you know, society joining together and uh, without clear, consistent list of demands, without uh, a clear class nature, but the fact that those movements did not have a clear class nature does not make them into uh, American inspired coup d'etat or something like this. This is just simply not true. And uh, this was never true about uh, Maidan. It was not uh, an American created coup. It was not uh, a coup d'etat at all. It was a real social movement that deposed uh, a regime. 
that was uh, consolidating its authoritarian rule. Because uh, uh, when you have 100,000 people on the streets who are ready to go under bullets, you know, snipers firing at them, this is not a coup. This is a real social movement. And uh, we as leftists might not like it because it was not led by leftists, but to deny that it was a real movement of the people is to deny reality. So this is what about, you know, those color revolutions, so-called color revolutions. And in fact, this is Putin's worldview. This is exactly what he is saying. Any kind of democratic movement in any post-Soviet country is just uh, an avatar of American power. So th this is Putin's narrative. And this is what you can, uh, if you watch Russian TV, this is exactly what they tell you. But this is just a denial of uh, reality. The question of NATO. Absolutely, it's true that uh, American imperialism has interests in the post-Soviet region. So yeah, I do not deny that. And uh, NATO expansion was um, a way for the United States to weaken Russian presence in the region. But then again, to answer this with military action will always be counterproductive. In Ukraine, uh, more than 60% of people opposed Ukraine joining NATO even a couple of years ago. But after Putin started to concentrate the troops on the Ukrainian border, this number went down to 20% for an obvious reason that who will protect Ukraine if not NATO? Like This, this isn't just sort of obvious that when you have 200,000 soldiers uh, with tanks, with uh, everything stationed on your borders, obviously people want to join NATO. Now it becomes a popular demand. And instead of threatening mil military action, Putin's other option was to try to create an attractive model of uh, social organization, of political organization, so that Ukraine would naturally gravitate towards Russia just because, you know, Ukrainian people do not want NATO, they want closer ties with Russia. This was possible if only Russian regime was not a kleptocratic Bonapartist regime, you know, but, but because it, precisely because it is a regime that has nothing to offer to the Russian population or to the population of Ukraine, like Putin completely lost Ukrainian people. And this is why he decided to launch the invasion. But this invasion will not help him to, to, to fight American imperialism in any way, short term, medium term, long term. He already lost this. It, it just doesn't make sense to launch an invasion on the country in order to, to stop NATO expansion. So, and in fact, as a leftist, obviously I oppose NATO expansion. I, I don't like NATO. And uh, as a Russian, uh, like I, I, I remember the bombing of uh, Serbia. And NATO is not a defensive alliance because of this. So when they repeat, we're defensive alliance, defensive alliance. So everyone saw what happened in Serbia. But at the same time, with this goal of opposing NATO, now I see that uh, NATO will encircle Russia. And there is nothing that Russia can do with this because of this invasion. Because now Poland said that it will welcome nuclear missiles. They were not stationed in Poland and Romania before, by the way. It's just not true. But now they will be stationed there because Putin has launched this war. And this is inevitable. Like, no one could do anything with this. Now Russia will be truly encircled by NATO. And I think that at some point, Ukraine will also join NATO. Just, just because uh, Putin cannot stop it now in any way. So his only choice was actually to influence the populations of these countries. Because uh, originally in Ukraine, no one wanted to join NATO. Ukrainian people did not have this demand. And uh, all this persuading by Victoria Nuland was just useless for this. There was, uh, yes, there was some kind of civil society with some uh, European and American backing, but it was completely marginal. But now people do want to join NATO. If you ask an ordinary Ukrainian, Ukrainian, he would say not only that we want to join NATO, but uh, let's throw a nuclear bomb at Russia in order to stop uh, you know, Russia from killing our children. And this is completely understandable. So in that sense, uh, you know, <laughs> making this war about NATO, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, so everyone understands this. 
but Putin doesn't understand this. So we should think like this, like we understand that NATO will expand in presence because of the war, but Putin somehow didn't understand this. It's very difficult to, to get this position. And in that sense, uh, Russian imperialism is not, uh, yes, there is an inter-imperial rivalry, but it was not directly caused by NATO expansion. I think the reasons for this war are different. These reasons are ideological, and these reasons lie in irredentist uh, Russian nationalism, imperial Russian nationalism. And uh, that was developing inside the Russian state. And finally, it's, uh, you know, expressed itself in this way. Previn, myself, and Wiley are on spec. Uh, Wiley, Previn spoken before, so I'm going to call on Wiley first. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert, but um, I understand there was a political opening in Russia in the 1990s, and that this decade also saw a massive decrease in the welfare of the working class. So I wonder from a materialist perspective, um, what does the working class have to gain that replaces Putin with a populist leader if the politics of the populist movement are so collective? I wondered if there are any specific issues in Russia that are seen as particularly galvanizing for the left, and uh, what the role of the Communist Party is in Russian politics, what their attitude is. Yeah, actually, if I could jump in, because my I had a similar question I was going to ask about the the role of the, I guess what you call the red brown, the old nostalgic uh, nationalist Russian Communist Party, because I, I guess that still is the the by the only functioning really opposition party in Russia, and there's I've heard that they are expected to do very well in. If in the next parliamentary election, if there is one, and I'm wondering, you know, you know, is there any chance of that party evolving into something other than an old nostalgic nationalist party, uh, if more young people were to get interested in it? And uh, because it, it does seem to me that the only a, only a mass movement can change the current regime in Russia, and a mass movement is possible, as we have seen under Latin American dictatorships, it is possible if the working classes can, there are ways to organize people under repressive regimes. So uh, if you want to put those two questions together, you can. So the question about the Communist Party. First of all, uh, the Communist Party is not an opposition in any sense, because Russian political system does not work as a uh, you know, a Western-style parliamentary democracy. The Communist Party is subordinated to the Kremlin. There is a special department within the administration of the president that deals with all parliamentary parties in Russia. And the person who heads this department has uh, Gennady Zyuganov, the leader of the Communist Party. He can just call him and say how he should vote on any measure. So it is just a part of uh, the regime. It's one of the auxiliaries of the Russian regime. It exists to absorb uh, the discontent of a certain group of people and then make something completely meaningless out of it. So the Communist Party it does not exist as, a, as an agent of anything. It, it is just part of this you know, infrastructure of the regime. And... Uh, uh, when the regime decides that it does no longer it, it no longer needs the Communist Party, so it will be just shut down, and now and Zyuganov will not protest this in any way. On the other hand, on the level of some grassroots activists that still exist within the Communist Party, although there were a series of purges and all of them they were expelled, like <laughs> most of them they were expelled. The, the, the purges started in the 90s. And uh, ironically, all of these people who were expelled from the Communist Party, they were called Trotskyists, even though uh, the actual Trotskyists was like 1% of them. Just all, all the people who, who had a truly leftist orientation, they were expelled and called Trotskyists. In any case, the Communist Party is not so, like something we, we place our hopes in. At the same time, there are several organizations of people who were expelled from the Communist Party now they exist uh, independently. These organizations have some, some agency, they have some connections maybe with uh, the working class. And uh, what we witness now is a split in those uh, like communist leftist organizations on the question of war. So 
some people support the war, even among those, you know, those who were expelled from the Communist Party. Some people reject the war, and uh, now these organization, uh, organizations are split. And by the way, the Communist Party is one of the most fervent supporters of this invasion. So this is important to understand. I mean, I, I don't think that like people in the West actually grasp this, that Zyuganov is one of the most vocal supporters of this war and uh, all of the ensuing atrocities and uh, the destruction of uh, the lives of Ukrainians. Actually, Zyuganov supports the war 100%. In that sense, uh, if there is going to be a working organization of the working class, I don't think that it will be connected to the Communist Party in any way. Maybe uh, some people who were, by, uh, by the way, if there are some people like politicians who have some agency or who are members of the Communist Party, paradoxically, I don't I understand that like you don't want to hear this, but, but paradoxically, they owe their positions to Navalny because Navalny has the strategy of so-called smart voting, you know, tactical voting. And that's, uh, that meant voting for the, the Communist Party in uh, single mandate districts. And so <laughs> Navalny actually supported Communist Party candidates. And uh, e e if there are some people in the Communist Party now who have some conscience left and who are willing even to oppose the war, this is because Navalny helped to get them elected. So, <laughs> I mean, this is the reality. That you that we have in Russia, and 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 like when people say that uh, Navalny is uh, just a CIA created candidate who is just against uh, you know uh, whatever, so Navalny actually so there was a tactical alliance between Navalny and those aspiring politicians who work within the framework of the Communist Party, but they always faced pressure from the leadership of the Communist Party from Zyuganov, because essentially the leadership was controlled by the regime. And those aspiring, you know, people, uh, they they did not owe their position to Zyuganov. They owed their position to Navalny and to people who voted for them. That That's the situation now. So, for instance, uh, in Moscow, there is a member of the Moscow uh, parliament, of the municipal parliaments called Evgeny Stupin. He is now a member of, uh, uh, he is a member of the Communist Party. Uh, but he's against the war. So, but uh, Stupin was elected to, to, to he, he got his seat in the Moscow parliament because Navalny supported him as a candidate. So, <laughs> so in that sense, uh, Navalny was quite helpful in uh, creating any kind of opposition to the war, e even within the Communist Party. Yeah, the question about the working class. So uh, do I understand correctly that you want to hear about the economic dynamics, right? I wonder what are the well, also, also uh, the question of people coming, uh, you know, there's going to be casualties, physical casualties from this war. Most of them will be, you know, poor guys. And, and uh, certainly in the United States during Vietnam, that the impact of that on building opposition was very important. So maybe you could bring, throw that in too when we're talking about the working class. It's true, and I think uh, there will be a very real impact because the number of casualties is staggering in this war. Even official numbers were, so uh, several weeks ago, the number that they uh, claimed was uh, 1,400 people, which is over, like several times lower than the real number of casualties. And even this official number, it did not include uh, the people from Donbass, those so-called militias of these people's republics. And uh, it did not include uh, these mercenary groups like uh, Wagner. It was only the Russian army. And from the army, the official figure was uh, 1,400 people. So during the war in Afghanistan, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, it was something like 3,000 people. And I think already, the, and it was uh, 10 years, I think already the number of casualties uh, in this conflict is higher than all, all the people who died in Afghanistan during the Soviet war. This will have an impact. And um, the question is, like, I, I think it is already having an impact. And I think there is uh, discontent and frustration sort of emerging 
in different sections of Russian society, including the working class. The question is, what can they do in this situation, these people? So how, how can they express this discontent? I, I, do, I don't see how this can play out. So maybe in the long run, like I said, they, there, there are going to be some kind of desperate actions by people, some kind of uh, demonstrations and uh, demonstra- driven by desperation, economic desperation and uh, the fact that uh, like dead soldiers are coming to Russia. And maybe this will have some impact on uh, also the elite, on the cohesion and the elite. This, may, they, this might drive some kind of conflict within the elite. But immediately, I don't see that how, how this can impact like anything. Into like the economic platform of the opposition movement. Uh, if they're offering something economically better to the working class. So the problem is that um, it's it's very difficult to organize the working class on economic demands in the conditions of uh, economic crisis because there is no, no leverage. And uh, when workers are being fired, when they lose their jobs, it's for for instance, trade union activity is basically like impossible. Even if we put aside uh, political pressure, there is this problem that uh, trade unions cannot grow when there is economic decline. There was a period in the 2000s, then there was strong, rather strong growth in the Russian economy. And uh, there were places in Russia where there was industrial growth, sort of reindustrialization, and uh, independent trade unions actually followed this process of reindustrialization in, place, in places like uh, St. Petersburg and uh, the area around St. Petersburg. There, there was like um, uh, a group of uh, automobile factories built there, uh, producing automobiles for uh, Western brands. Also places like Kaluga with automobile factories all kinds of uh, manufacturing, uh, like manufacturing companies coming to these areas. And there were independent trade unions, quite militant trade unions, but uh, most of them, uh, well, so uh, automotive industry is finished in Russia. So it was in deep crisis before, but now without uh, components that arrive from Europe, uh, all of these factories are just closed currently so they do not work because uh, they do not receive components from uh, from the west so uh, currently it's a furlough for the workers but i think that they will not reopen so in that sense uh, so how do you organize the working class if the factories are not working so that that's a big problem one of the successes uh, was organizing uh, public sector employees for instance, there is a, a healthcare workers union, uh, an independent healthcare workers union uh, that is quite successful and that still that is still successful. So uh, they organized a lot of doctors who are actually and also uh, nurses who are in Russia all uh, public employees because Russian healthcare is fully uh, you know it's a state state run uh, healthcare. So uh, the same with teachers. There is an independent union of school teachers and uh, there were some successes there. The economic crisis in Russia basically lasts from uh, 2014 and uh, stagnation began uh, more than a decade ago. And so advances in industrial working class were not, were not there. But uh, in the public sector, there were some successes. And I, and I think that... Um, in any potential improvement of the political situation, like public sector trade unions will uh, will be important. This is how would, I would answer this. Uh, Ilya and Oleg, thank you so very much. Thank you so much. It's really a great effort. Very enlightening. Greg, did you want to chime in? Uh, I'd just like to uh, thank Ilya and Oleg. O- Oleg, oh, sorry you couldn't <laughs> arrive a bit earlier. I'm sure Ilya uh, would have liked it too to ease uh, some of his burden. And uh, I guess thank you again for the marvelous article. Uh, it kind of, as you mentioned, it, it, the things of the developments of, uh, subsequently have kind of sh- changed uh, some of the weight of the article, but I think it also still prefaces uh, a lot of what, uh, of, uh, of what you analyze in terms of the developments of the war. 
which I think most of us are concurrent in terms of what you're analyzing in terms of, of Russia. Uh, but there is was an angle that's also in the volume uh, that's also looking at, at, at America's global strategy coming from Walden Bellow in the Philippines and analyzing the conflict between China and, and Russia, emphasizing a couple of points about uh, a couple of things about the, the longer term uh, American geopolitical strategy and how it shapes up in this moment. For us in North America, uh, in particular, uh, the fusion of that strategy in terms of, of, of forward positioning of NATO and especially American troops, uh, which now Canada is in the process of doing too, uh, also developing our own bases in a few parts, a few parts of the world for that forward positioning. The upgrading of, of the d- defense systems, particularly the nuclear launch uh, systems, uh, is important. And also, you know, the general strategy, which they've been, uh, have employed everywhere, and we see them trying to employ it now in, in the China Sea of overmatch, of just building, 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 uh, and bringing things to the point of a boil or confrontation as part of a kind of a, a, a geopolitical politics is an important, to me, dimension of this uh, with, I think, then, what you say about the, the misreadings of and Putin on strategy, plus the kind of politics around it, underneath it is, you know, why this conflict is so uncontrollable with kind of unintended, uh, possible unintended consequences of all kinds that we still have a hard time uh, probably uh, making any kind of conclusions about or calculations about. So thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was really good to see uh, something that we're not getting uh, here much on. uh, Even uh, the media on the war is very uh, how uh, at the best uh, uh, open to some dissidents in, in Russia, but not kind of the dissidents in uh, notes that you and Oleg were bringing in your essay and, and, and a wider view of understanding the types of politics that underpin the, the Russian regime and why then this conflict has taken on the form it has. So thank you very much for your comments, uh, Ilya, and for the insightful essay. Thank you. And, and Oleg, yeah. sorry. And Oleg, we wish Thank you had everybody more, who took of your, part more of your comments. And, <laughs> yeah. And don't forget uh, next month, the last of the four sessions, and maybe we'll have a follow up if we can bring, get David Harvey yeah. and the Brazilians back. Yeah. back maybe the final, the, final uh, thing I'd say, the final thing I'd say, we have actually had a, a long history in the register of, of kind of, 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 of trying to get in our pages. Uh, the best uh, Russian intellectuals. And we've had, uh, you know, Buskalin in the ba- past, uh, uh, Kagerlotsky, uh, Western commentators who are, have been uh, at least immersed in Russian and Eastern European debates, uh, Peter Gowan and David Mandel. So we've always had a kind of a range of this and we we're very pleased on that basis as well that we've able to have Ilya and Oleg in our papers uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. And don't forget next Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday after the, the, uh, the talk about uh, the climate uh, change struggle of revolutions from below, which is kind of relevant to this the question of revolutions from below. So, all right. Thank you all. Thank yeah. you, Greg. Thank Dave, you. Hi. Thank you. The entire group that came. Great day. Thank you.